This is Alabama Politics with Steve Flowers, an in-depth interview with Alabama's top political newsmakers. Now, from the studios of Troy University, here is Steve Flowers. I'm Steve Flowers, and welcome to Alabama Politics. Folks, we are very, very fortunate tonight to have as our guest one of my favorite guys in Alabama politics, a political legend, an icon in Alabama politics, former Governor Don Sigelman. Don, good to have you on the show. <laughs> I'm glad to be here, Steve. This is my first time. Don, y'all, I'm going to tell you, he has got a record in Alabama politics that will never be matched again. I've got another record, too, that hopefully will not be, <laughs> won't be matched either. Don Sigelman. <laughs> was elected Secretary of State two terms, eight years. He was elected Attorney General of Alabama four years, elected Lieutenant Governor four years, and elected Governor of Alabama. He I was elected twice, only served once. They, they stole that second election. Okay, from that's right. But that, you were elected first in 98? 98. 98, 98 and uh, re-elected on the night of 2002. Uh huh. And then after we went to bed, uh, I'm within, County. within four minutes after the polls closed and the courthouse was locked shut, four minutes later they produced a second total where they just subtracted 6,000 of my votes and didn't affect a single down ballot race. It's totally impossible. Did y'all, what did y'all do about investigating that? Did well, we tried to, we, we, <laughs> it, we it called, we called for a hand recount of the one precinct where the votes disappeared. Initially, the sheriff, probate judge, and circuit clerk all agreed that we could come down and get a hand recount of this one precinct. But before we could get to Baldwin County, Bill Pryor, who was then the uh, uh, client, general. yeah, he was the attorney general, but client of Carl Rose, seized all the ballots, illegally took them to Montgomery where they were certified two days before the law allows for a certification. You can't certify until after 12 noon on Friday. In my case, with the illegal votes, they certified it on Wednesday, Wednesday at some point but the point is, we were getting back to how long I had served. I, yeah, you were right. You were right on the on the number of offices I held and the the elections I won. Except I contend that I won 2002 and it was stolen. It looks pretty bad. Now, when you were tw when you were elected Secretary of State, you weren't even 30 years old, were you? Oh gosh, about 29 or right, right around 30. Uh, but, that's what uh, I was thinking. Yeah. You you grew up in Mobile, and uh, you went to Murphy High School, and went to Alabama was president of SGA at Alabama. Correct. And then you went to uh, study in, in Oxford, England for a little while. Well, I, yeah, I went to, um, I was actually enrolled in law school in Alabama, uh, at the University of Alabama, and uh, in the fall of 68, but I instead chose to work in a congressional campaign. Who uh, did you work in? I worked in, in New York on Long Island oh, okay. for a friend of mine who was running for Congress uh -huh. for the first time, and he won. So the next year, I'd been accepted to Alabama, Georgetown, and the University of Virginia, and, and uh, uh, the, my friend who was elected to Congress asked me to come up and work in his office. In and Georgetown, that's why so you went, went to Georgetown. Georgetown. That's why you went to Georgetown. And then I went to Oxford. Uh -huh. uh, After Georgetown. After Georgetown. Uh -huh. and, and Big Jim, Big Jim, <laughs> Big Jim Folsom told me, he said, son, you ought to tell them that was Oxford, Mississippi. They're going to like that a whole lot better. I heard, the story I heard was Oxford High School. He yeah, said, no, you ought to go to Oxford, <laughs> Oxford High School. <laughs> Big Jim was pragmatic, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was a progressive, though. Oh, gosh, he was a wonderful man. Yeah, I yeah. love I loved Big Jim. He was, Big Jim and Bill Baxley were my two political heroes. And uh, I talked to Bax this morning. Oh, gosh. He's, no. he, he's got a steel trap for mine. I had written a column about the second congressional district. I said it had been a Republican since 64. He says, tree, you're wrong. Bobby Bright served two, one two-year term in there. And he, he, he remembers every little minute detail. Reads my, reads my column in Tuscaloosa News. <laughs> Even though he lives in Vestavia. A lot of folks in Birmingham read Tuscaloosa News now. And so anyway, let me get off on that. But uh, I, you and I have been friends a long time. You oh, did a so good job as governor. Uh, you, you know, uh, tried to pass that lottery, and that's what messed you up. I mean, I've always, I, when I walked in today, I said, everybody I say, 
that Don Siegel has done wrong, and everybody in this state says the same thing. Well, they need to they need to read my book. That's what we want to talk about. Yeah. It's, yeah. The title of the book, as you know, I gave you one of the first early uh -huh. copies. Called Let's show it. Can we get it on the screen? Let's see. Uh, Stealing our democracy, and you know when you. It's just out by New South Books. Stealing our democracy. And this book is not. You know, yeah, it's a memoir of sorts, but it's a it's an expose uh, of the who, what, why, when, and how uh, this political assassination, as I call it, came about. It's not a, but it's not about me. It's about healing our country and protecting our democracy from those people who would abuse their power for political greed. And it's, it's not only something that happened to me, but it is something that is continuing on today. Um, you know, for those people who, who doubt, and there are a lot of people, I'm sure, in Alabama who, who don't understand or haven't, haven't read enough to know about what happened to me or why. And that's the reason Tell I Tell the whole story about it. Well. Uh, you know, stealing our democracy tells the story, but um, if they if they if they don't believe that it that democracy can be stolen, one look at my election: six thousand votes simply disappeared in four minutes. But secondly, when I decided at that moment I was going to run for re-election in two thousand and six, the the plan came about to take me out through a political prosecution. Tommy Gallion has come forward with an affidavit uh, telling his tale about what happened and why, pointing his finger at Laura Canary, the U.S. attorney uh, who was appointed by George W. Bush. Laura Canary is the wife of Billy Canary, who was a national politi Republican political operative. Rove, Carl Rove, and, and Billy Canary, after the 1992 election when George Hubert Walker Bush lost to Bill Clinton, they came through Texas and came to Alabama, both married uh, Alabama girls. Uh, Rove settled at Rosemary Beach on the Gulf Coast and uh, Billy Canary settled here in Montgomery. They set up political shop. Uh, they were working together, uh, paid by the business community to take over the Alabama Supreme Court, uh, starting in 1994 when uh, they first, I say, stole the election from Sonny Hornsby, who had, who had won the election, uh, went through circuit court, the state Supreme Court, and then uh, it went into a federal court in Montgomery where they disallowed certain, a certain number of absentee votes from being counted, and it swung the election to uh, 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 Perry Hooper Sr. Nice, wonderful man, decent fellow, good lawyer, uh, but I contend that Sonny Hornsby actually won that election. But anyway, Carl Rove and Billy Canary were in business. When my trouble started, uh, Carl Rove had a client in the Attorney General's office, Bill Fryer. The investigation was started in 1999, March the 19th, <laughs> just weeks after I got inaugurated. Um, as my friend Chip Hill said, before I had a chance to even rearrange the furniture or <laughs> learn how to use the telephone, mm -hmm. they had started an investigation. So the investigation was, was under the auspices of a, an assistant attorney general named Matt Hart, the United States Department of Justice has released a letter which says that Matt Hart was in, e at that time, in December of 2002, he was in email communication with Bob Riley's campaign manager. Um, so we have the, the prosecutor who was under Bill Pryor, who was leading the investigation, was in email communication with my opponent's campaign manager, while the U.S. attorney, Laura Canary's husband, 
had been paid as a political consultant to defeat me while she was starting the federal investigation. The federal investigation led to my indictment in 2004 with uh, the, the case lasting only less than a day when Judge U.W. Clemens said it was the most unfounded criminal case over which he had presided in his 29 years and seven months on the bench. Uh, sitting in the back of that courtroom that day was a federal uh, former FBI agent named Bill Long. Bill Long was a retired FBI agent who worked for Jeff Sessions. Back up a year, in 2003, after Bob Riley had, had been inaugurated and had kicked off his campaign to raise property taxes, he was known as Billion Dollar Bob, and his, his popularity had hit <coughs> rock bottom. Polls out of uh, the Mobile Register and the Birmingham News were saying that in a head-to-head -head contest, I would, I would trounce Bob Riley in a, in a rematch in 2006. Marty Connors went to, <laughs> went to Washington and uh, was attempting to get Jeff Sessions to run against me in 2006 because in th at that time, he was the only one strong enough to both win the Republican nomination and to defeat me in 2006. He was uh, already in the U.S. Senate. What's that? Was Sessions already in the U.S. Sessions Senate? Sessions was in the U.S. Senate uh -huh. at that time. Now, Sessions was uh, another interesting point I bring out in the book is that after my election was stolen, Bill Pryor, Carl Rove's client, was appointed uh, to the federal bench, and, and uh, Billy Canary was quoted as saying, we would have gotten Bill appointed to the bench earlier, but we needed a Republican governor in place first. So that, that brings us to the 2004 trial, which was thrown out for being the most unfounded criminal case the judge had ever seen. My case in 2006 was not prepared by the FBI. It was put together by Jeff Sessions' retired FBI agents. The long guy. Bill Long primarily wow. and others. But th this was not something that the federal government was pushing. This was something that was being pushed by, by initially by the, uh, the invest former investigators that had worked for Jeff Sessions when he was the U.S. Attorney. This was all during the time when the Republican Party was trying to get Jeff Sessions to run against me in 2006. So then inject a, another Karl Rove player, Jack Abramoff, Oh, gosh. Jack, Jack Abramoff, Ralph Reed, Grover Norquist, and, and Karl Rove were, were part of the college young Republicans. And they are the players that came into Alabama and worked to defeat me, both, both defeat the lottery and to defeat me in 2002 and 2006. But Abramoff, uh, both in his book, Capital Punishment, and on the documentary, uh, Atticus versus the Architect, the independent documentary that was made about my case, Abramoff admits that they brought in $20 million of Indian casino money, laundered Indian casino money illegally in violation of federal anti-laundering laws, money laundering laws, and contrary to Alabama law as well, to, to both defeat the lottery and to defeat me. Uh, as Jack Abramoff says in his book and on tape, we had to stop Sigelman. Because I represented, as you were about to point out, my lottery would have been a threat to the Indian gaming right. that was going on in Philadelphia and other places in Mississippi. So there was sort of a confluence of interest. The Indian casinos, uh, Jack Abramoff, their lobbyists, who was running money through a bogus organization then called the Christian Coalition, which was nothing but a conduit for casino cash from Mississippi mm -hmm. to uh, defeat the lottery. To defeat the lottery. Uh -huh. 
I think most people have recognized that as soon as it was happening, that so-called Christian coalition was Indian gambling money yeah. just to defeat the, the, the lottery. I think most Alabamians, people who knew what was going on politically, saw that amount of money was not raised by grassroots rural churches in Alabama. Yeah, they, 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 they commented that the money came through church bake sales, but that's, <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. didn't happen. I don't think anybody no. realized, believed that no. new thing was going on in politics. But so this, this book is not, it's not about me. It's about uh, protecting our democracy and doing, you know, doing what we need to do now to stop the, the use of power for political gain, whether it's uh, a, a local official or the President of the United States. And you, know, you, can, you can see now in what is happening in Washington that, and I talk about it in, in my book, um, you know, whether you think it's right or not, you know, President Trump initially fired Sally Yates, who is the acting uh, U.S. attorney, acting, I'm sorry, acting uh, director of the FBI uh, and the D Department of Justice. He fired uh, James Comey. He fired uh, Andrew McCabe. And then he hired and fired Jeff Sessions. And he hired Bill Barr, who is using the Department of Justice as a shield to protect the president. Some people may think, well, that's a good thing, but that's not what the Department of Justice has been set up for. It's, it's not to be used as a shield to protect someone or as a weapon to go after your political enemies. No, it's not. It's not. You know, uh, but back, back to the 2006 uh, thing, um, you know, the, the, the irony and the ludicrousness of your conviction is that you were raising money for a lottery, not for your own campaign, not for your own personal use. Right. I mean, that's why people know it was done, it was a wrong deal. I mean, you know, even if you were raising the campaign money, even if Scrooge had given you campaign money for your personal campaign, that's not illegal. I mean, people have been given people who are sitting on the CN board have been given governor's campaign contributions. Yeah, it wasn't even to me since day one. But you take it a step further, the contribution that Scrooge gave was for a lottery campaign. Had nothing to do with your campaign, much less you. Right. You weren't going to make a dime off of it. Right. You weren't going to make a dime off a lottery. The yeah. school children of Alabama are only going to benefit from the lottery. I mean, you weren't going to make any money off of it. You know, uh, you yeah. used all your political chits to get it passed. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> to, to vote for the doggone thing. And it, it would have passed had not that Christ, that Indian gambling money come in here. I think you're right. It passed. Yeah. I, I've said that in columns. It passed. And people say, well, it didn't pass in 1999. I said, yeah, but it didn't have a half million dollars, uh, four million dollars spent against it either. The last week saying it was a bad yeah. deal or something like that. Oh yeah, we, yeah, a lottery, but not this lottery. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. You know, but they were they were they were pouring Indian casino money into Alabama to defeat the lottery. Uh, four million dollars of it. You mentioned four million. There was a lot, a lot more than that, but four million dollars of it went straight to the Christian coalition which they in turn gave out to uh, African American churches telling them to preach that this is against the mor uh, morality of the people and convince the African American voters to stay at home to, su to suppress the vote then they gave money to you know <laughs> to Briarwood and all the, all the white churches telling the, the white preachers to turn out the vote against the lottery because you know mm -hmm. they knew that, that they, could, they could get a bigger vote out of the white community against the lottery, mm -hmm. keep the African Americans at home and turn out the white voters against the lottery, and mm -hmm. that's what they did. Yeah, still didn't lose by much. Uh, well, boy, if you put that thing on the ballot today, I'm gonna tell you it passed 70-30, maybe we, 75. We you know, one of our polls right before the election was showing that 72% of the people favored the lottery. It, it fluctuated in the, in the mid-60s to the low 70s, even back in 1999. Don, has anybody ever put a figure 
to the if that water proposal you had you proposed, which the Indian gamblers out of Mississippi beat, how much money we've lost in the last twenty years? I wonder how much it's been we've lost to oh. Georgia and Mississippi. Oh, it Mississippi be, runs half their government off of it. Now. It would be billions and billions, and billions of dollars. Not 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 a billion, not five billion. I'd say way more than ten billion. Do you know? I don't know what percent it is, but do you know Mississippi funds a good percentage of their whole government off gambling now? And they're not any more religious than we are. I mean, you talk about being a religious state. I mean, yeah. why well, maybe? What makes Mississippi more less religious than we are? I mean, I don't know yeah. how the, they run half this government off of their, yeah. off that those casinos and everything. Well, now know, they got a Powerball lottery and everything. You know, I I spoke to the uh, Southern Baptist and uh, 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 Reverend Wolf actually invited me and got me in, in, involved and to speak to him and about the lottery. And I knew at I, that time or at recently? that time, mm -hmm. and I knew it was going to be a tough sell, but. I remember, you know, getting one question, and they, you know, saying, you know, this is immoral. It's going to lead to sin, and it's going to lead to prostitution, and we're going to have drunks on the street, and and they said this is it's just immoral. You can't you can't bring a lottery. And I said, let me tell you what I think is immoral. I think what's immoral is when you have children who want to reach their God-given potential through education, but they can't. But if we could give children the hope and dream of of one day being able to go to college for free you know that maybe they would stay in school and stay out of trouble and make their grades and when you deny children the right to reach their god-given potential that's what i call immoral you know don um you were doing the right thing we need to have it done but you know um would your lottery, all, it was patterned exactly after Georgia's where it go to education, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Like the Hope Scholarship thing. Exactly. Do you know right now, I probably fit into a category that would, uh, is the reason this thing would pass 75-25. I don't care if the Indians put $50 million in there against it, if the gambling casinos. If you give Alabamians the right to vote for that now, they're not going to be hoodwinked again. And the reason is, I've never bought a lottery ticket. I probably never will. <laughs> I've got, I got better sense to know the odds of just, yeah. if I'm going to give a dollar away, I'd rather give it to the church or something, you know, because yeah. I ain't going to win the lottery. But what I'm saying is I don't, I don't know how to play a slot machine. But that I, was, like, I like Bill McGregor. He's my good friend, but I, I never went to one of his play. But I'm going to tell you something. I'd be waiting in line to vote for a lottery because I'm tired of my mo our money going to every state around us. That's why it would pass. And they got enough walk around since now to know that, by God, people are going to buy lottery tickets. But, you know, my point, you, you brought up something, and this was one of the things that I, I thought would help sell the lottery back in 99, is that even though you knew you weren't going to win the lottery, chances are you're not going to win, right? Right. <laughs> but at least you know your dollar is going exactly. to ed help educate kids. It's going to stay in this state. Right. So you know, I don't, I don't want my money going to Georgia. So this is, it's a good thing. It's a win-win. I don't want my neighbor's money to dri have to drive to, 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 to Cleveland County yeah. or to Florida to buy a lottery ticket. I mean, they're liable to get killed, you know, <laughs> on the road, and, you know, and, 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 and the money's going to Florida. You know, it's like that. That's why it would pass. Well, I, I talk about it in stealing our democracy. It's another, you know, when you when elections are stolen, whether it's a lottery election or a local election, if it's gerrymandering or or actually, you know, hacking a an election machine, when you steal democracy, it has an impact on what happens in in the state and what happens in our country. And in my book, I talk about ways that we can help balance the scales of justice, and that's, that's what I want to do now. Um, I, while I was in prison, obviously I had a lot of time to write. <laughs> you write most of it while you were there. I wrote, I, wrote, I, I wrote another huge volume, 640 pages, and this is a condensed version of a larger book that I wrote while I was in prison. But I felt compelled to warn people against the, the danger of political prosecutions and the danger and the damage that 
the abuse of power can have on our democracy. And in the, in the process of, of uh, helping other inmates and going through uh, what I did myself in the, in the criminal justice system, I saw things that uh, simply were wrong and needed to be fixed. So I, I talk about those, those kinds of practical criminal justice reforms as well in this book. And at the end of the book, it's a, it's a call to action. Uh, call to action for people across the country to get involved and uh, you know, help one find people with whom they agree politically and work for them, help them get elected and uh, stay with them after the election, make sure they do the things that they committed to do during their campaign. And I believe that if we, if we pull together and find candidates we believe in, uh, if we work long enough and hard enough, we can change things, we can make things better, and we can make Alabama and this country everything we know it can and should be. Well, I've said this, we were talking about, you hit on it briefly, we gotta close out, but I've, I've told, and, and your story has resonated so much with me that I have young people come to me sometimes and they say, you think I ought to run for office? And I will simply say, sir, you got a lot of talent, but let me give you an example of somebody. So if Don Siegelman had taken his Georgetown law degree and simply gone to Birmingham and practiced law, rather than fooling and being governor or attorney general of Alabama, he'd had a lot happier life, you know. For then, then all he was all he was prosecuted for by political for political prosecution, and sent to federal prison was trying to pass a lottery, <laughs> you know, for the people of Alabama. He didn't make a dime, you know. So, your story. It almost precludes young people from wanting to get in the political arena because you were politically prosecuted wrongly, and uh, and and you know it's a sad story. But I'm glad you're telling it. Well, that's why I want people to read this book, and let's uh, let's try to change things and make things better. Folks, the book "Stealing Our Democracy" by Governor Don Siegel. We thank you for taking time to be with us. We thank you viewers for watching our Bible politics. Hope you tune in again next week. <laughs> thank you so much.